Now for the final segment, concealed carry and the law. The laws of ownership, carry, and self-defense, and storage as well. So in Virginia, as a result of the change in the legislature, all purchases must go through a federal, federal firearms licensee and with a background check, which the, the Virginia State Police runs. Uh, the days of uh, meeting your friend in the parking lot and your currency for his product are gone if you want to remain completely legal. When you purchase a gun, there are state and federal forms to fill out. Uh, they do the background check. For most people, it's, it's over in a matter of minutes. For others with a more common name or if you share a name with someone who has been uh, in contact in a negative fashion with the law, it can take a while. So just be, factor that in and be prepared. Now, in store, Virginia, for laws of storage, there is uh, one on the books, as you can read. It's a crime to recklessly leave a loaded, unsecured firearm where a minor under 14 can access it. I can't recall offhand anyone being charged for that, but I'm sure it's on the books somewhere. The back end of that, though, if that happens, it might have been, as a, if you do get charged, it's a result of a child accessing a firearm and something terrible happening. So educate your children, uh, but trust but verify. You just can't turn your back. Also think about this. Your kids can be perfectly uh, well behaved and educated and trained to leave your stuff alone. Eventually they're going to have friends over. Eventually your kids can go to the bathroom and leave that friend unattended for a moment. And tragedy can result. So places where you can and cannot carry, it changes uh, quite frequently here in Virginia, Virginia now. I recommend joining the Virginia Citizens Defense League, VCDL, and go to vcdl.org slash carry info for the latest on where you can and cannot carry your concealed pistol. Also note, localities now are able to establish their own carry laws. Uh, that's particularly in North, here in Northern Virginia, it's, it's become a, an issue, a patchwork quilt which preemption was meant to uh, overcome, but uh, those days are in the past, at least for the foreseeable future. Law enforcement interaction. Here are potential circumstances. A car stop. You're speeding or made an improper turn or a stop. Interaction that way. You call for service. Uh, someone calls for service on you. And after a self-defense incident, let me throw some general guidelines out for each of the, one of these circumstances. Uh, at the car stop, I'm recommending uh, hands on 10 and 2. No quick moves. Uh, roll down the window, converse with the officer in a respectful fashion. There is no duty to inform in Virginia. You don't have to tell the officer that you are armed. However, when they run the, your tags, it will come back registered register to John Murphy, concealed uh, pistol permit weapon holder. So they're going to know when they approach the car more than likely. Uh, if you choose to inform, I recommend not saying, I have a gun, I have a gun. Uh, in a calm vo voice, if you, let, if you if decide to answer the question, if they ask it, officer, I'm a lawfully armed citizen. How do you wish to proceed? Now, I'm not saying I'm a hardened criminal but I haven't been pulled over for speeding on a couple of occasions and on the odd missed stop sign. Uh, generally, uh, state troopers don't, they're, they're, uh, one guy said, I don't need to see it, and he just kept writing his ticket. Uh, one guy was uh, very, very like, you know, non just non -plastic. So Mr. Murphy, are, uh, uh, this is after the exchange, are you a private investigator or something because I see you have a concealed carry permit? And I said, nope, just a citizen exercising his rights. He's like, right on. Other officers in other jurisdictions I've heard are not as understanding. Uh, there have been instances where people are disarmed, the, the pistol is downloaded, the, magazine, the magazines around is stripped out of the magazines and they're left in the trunk until the officer leaves. That is a potential uh, interaction as well. Again, I'd recommend joining the Virginia Citizens Defense League to read up on this sort of things and ways to handle that because uh, VCDL is awesome at going after agencies to get people tightened back up to uh, perform their duties in accordance with the law. Uh, if you choose to, to in inform without informing, per se, when they say license and registration, please, sure, license, registration, your concealed carry permit, 
all in one bundle. That way, when the officer looks, he sees. That way, you're not saying anything, but you've said. Again, that's if you choose to inform. Uh, conflict interaction with police officers never ends well at that, at that time. So just make your point there as, as, as you can if you choose to issue, uh, issue, have any kind of uh, conflict or make an issue of it. But recognizing your best bet is to just fight it in court. So off you, off you go. Uh, if people call for service on you, again, no surprises. I have a gun! It's not the thing you want to be saying. Uh, officer, I'm a lawfully armed citizen. And this will probably be, if, you, if it's a conflict, if someone has seen you with a pistol, say you inadvertently flash your weapon, uh, or if you choose to open carry in Virginia, which is still a, a, a permissible under the law, and someone calls the cops on you, you're, you're probably going to be in for a very uh, polite exchange. Hey, sir, can I talk to you for a moment? Uh, someone's called, they saw you with a gun, they're a little bit concerned. I know you're legal, you know you're legal, but we're, we're here on their, at their behest. Ride the pony and recognize you're educating people as best you can and still exercising your right. Uh, if you've been in a conflict with someone over, I don't know, my God, parking spot, or someone accused you of looking at their girlfriend, just all the crazy human things that can happen, make sure your ego is checked and engage your brain before you start running your mouth. I'm not one of those. He's one of those. That's not going to make it. Officer, I'm, I'm glad you're here. There's been a conflict. That person has done X. I have done Y. I believe I'm in the right here. I just want to go. I just want to go. Uh, years ago, I had a student in the class, and he sat in the front row, and boy, he was, a, he was an intellect, but just with a touch of arrogance. And the second day during the lecture, I looked at him and said, you're a Harvard Law School student, aren't you? And, uh, yep, yes I am. And then he took off his jacket and had a shirt that said, Harvard Law, reasonable doubt and reasonable cost, which I thought was kind of amusing. But he made a point to me, and he said, no defense attorney has ever argued that his client spoke too little. So take that into account when you have interactions with law enforcement. Uh, I'll be discussing another potentiality here in a moment where you're going to want to make a statement, but we want to make the correct statement just enough. So I'm going to caveat all of this with, I am not a lawyer, but... Uh, I have taken uh, Masada Youth courses, and uh, well as Andrew Branca, I read the book, as it were. I've had exchanges with professionals in the field. But again, do not construe this as legal advice. Uh, I would strongly recommend that you seek an attorney for that. I have several I can refer you to if that is the, is the case. And you should actually kind of have one on tap anyway that you can reach out to just in case you have questions or have a big find yourself needing a lawyer. So if we talk about deadly force, the Marines taught me that deadly force is that force which is known or should be reasonably known to constitute the substantial likelihood of causing death or serious bodily harm. So if we pull this apart a little bit, the threat at that point must present a clear and imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm. And death is pretty obvious. Uh, serious bodily harm, uh, Loss of eye, uh, sexual assault, uh, breaking of limbs in an effort to, to disable you uh, in order to, have, to further have their way. Serious bodily harm. Multiple blows above the head, bouncing your head off the cement. Serious bodily harm at that moment. Uh, it can't be anything other than that where you're subjecting yourself to severe legal penalty. More not legal advice. Every incident must have these three essential elements of ability, opportunity, and jeopardy or imminence. This person must have the ability to harm you, the opportunity to do so, and the immediacy of that moment to put you into immediate jeopardy. Uh, the ability, he is armed. The opportunity, he is within range. And, and by armed, I mean he has a, he has a knife. Uh, the opportunity to do so, he is advancing on you at that moment. I can't have words with somebody uh, over, uh, over an exchange, and then I stalk them for a week, and then I ambush them with a rifle as they leave their house. That is not self-defense, because it's lacking in this last 
component, this element, of jeopardy and imminence. That would be first-degree murder. They must have the ability to harm you, the opportunity to do so, at that, at that moment. Self-defense is an affirmative defense. Uh, there has been a homicide, someone is dead, or there has been an aggravated assault with a lethal weapon. That much is indisputable. And it's not, I didn't do it, he did it kind of thing. You're, you're saying, yes, I did this. Now, depending upon your interpretation and what state you're in, the burden of proof can either shift to the prosecution if it, if it goes that far, that what you did was not reasonable, or you still have to prove to the court that it, what you did was reasonable. There are varying takes on this. You can read Branca, uh, and it's very by state by state. Uh, in Virginia, I am told that the burden still stays with you to prove that it was self-defense. But there's no question that you're saying that you did this. There's no, some other dude did it, I didn't do this. No, you're saying I, in fact, did this. You must not be the instigator in, in order to maintain the aura of innocence for self-defense. By instigator, I mean if I start a fight with someone and they're clocking me and, I'm, and I pull a pistol out and shoot him, that is not self-defense because I was a mutual willing combatant. And then when I started losing, I upped the ante to lethal force. And, that's, I, and you cannot make a claim like that and have it stand in a court. You'll be eviscerated. Alternatively, you can uh, resume the aura, the umbrella of innocence, the halo, if you are a mutual willing combatant, and then you try to disengage, stop, stop, you're killing me, you're killing me, but they don't stop. Then the pendulum can swing. However, I don't want to be the one to sit in front of a jury of 12 of my peers to make that argument. And, and you think about this for a moment. If you take a class in Masada Yub, and I really cannot recommend that enough, uh, MAG-20, Citizens Rules of Engagement, it's an amazing educational experience. Uh, the people in that jury box really are not your peers. Uh, many of them don't know anything about guns. Many of them have, uh, ha are left with a chill, with a very thought of, uh, of self-defense. It's, it's a separate part of society. So they're not really your peers. If your lawyer is good enough, however, they can bring you through, the edu that bring the jury through an educational process and at least make them understand which is why uh, lawyer selection for this sort of thing is so crucial. As I mentioned, the innocent pendulum halo can swing back and forth. But you just want to avoid the situation. Your goal is to be kicked out of this process as quickly as you can. I'll explain that in just a moment. So here's a concept, disparity of force. Here's a video to illustrate what I'm talking about picks up the dispute between the two parties as it moves down Market Street in front of the Fox 29 studios. One man rushes toward the other group. The man being rushed pulls a gun, as you can see here, points it left, points it right. Then this man, who will become the shooting victim, rushes the gunman. The gunman fires the gun multiple times. The victim is hit by five bullets in the hand, chest, and abdomen. When enhanced and slowed down, we see more of what happened. The victim and the shooter tumbling to the ground as the shots are being fired. Minutes after, police and EMS are on scene. The victim is alert and talking to police. The suspected shooter is taken into police custody. This event took place in Philadelphia some time ago. And what you had there was a young man, his girlfriend, and another couple out for an evening. During the course of the evening, they had an interaction with another group, uh, four or five young men that uh, subsequently followed them as a result of this friction from bar to bar to bar. Finally, after they left their final bar, they were walking down the street, and that uh, the second group kept circling the young man and his girlfriend at that, that party. Finally, uh, the young man's girlfriend stopped, and, well, what was going to happen was going to happen right then and there. Uh, she pushed a guy back. Uh, you saw the, uh, one young man charge in, uh, with his hands down, with, a, with that, I'm going to kick your butt kind of look going on. And the other young man had pulled a small pistol and waved it back and forth at, at a low ready because he didn't want to be beaten up. Well, subsequent to all this video, a couple of things came out. 
uh, the young man with the pistol, the, the, the defender in this case, was actually a law school student uh, up there, a local guy from Annandale, actually, here in Virginia. Uh, he was out with that other couple. The other guy was a local uh, 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 varsity uh, player, uh, some, some contact sport, sport, I can't recall, lacrosse. Uh, varsity captain of the team, the local lacrosse team, and he had a habit of getting drunk up and beating smaller guys. So they were, he was picking for a fight, you, you can see going back and forth. Uh, it, they were essentially outnumbered, that, the original group was outnumbered. Uh, four or five men to, to two men and, and two ladies, let's, let's just be honest where we are there, unless you're talking like MMA kind of women. Uh, when that couple, that lady stopped, the fight was anchored. What was going to happen was going to happen. So the guy was shot multiple times, as you saw, hand, chest, and abdomen. He went laid down. The police came, then you had the suspected shooter. And it took about 18 months for this to go to, go to trial. And the result was a not guilty verdict based upon the principle of disparity of force. That party, the aggressing party, could generate more violence than the defending party. There was a disparity of force. The same argument can be made uh, for people who are uh, older or infirm, injured, handicapped, crippled, or in this case, outnumbered. Uh, numbers are the weapon. If you've ever, if you've ever, if ever seen a public beatdown, were two or three or four guys on one, and they, they can just pick him up, knock him down, and then everyone puts the boot to him. That is a lethal force situation that you should consider. Remember the argument of the reasonable man, and that is if you can prevent or present to the court what you did was reasonable in the totality of the circumstances in which you did it, you stand a much better chance of getting a not guilty verdict but you must have been reasonable and proportional. I cannot recommend highly enough uh, Andrew Bronca's book, The Law of Armed, Self of Armed Self Defense. I think it's now in the third edition. Uh, he also has webinars, other cool stuff. He's really good at this. And if you can't get into a Ma Masayub class, that's certainly the way to go. Involving yourself in defense of a third party. That is, as I mentioned earlier, fraught with peril. And the rule of thumb that I've encountered is that if a person is being assaulted or a victim of a crime, which would justify their use of lethal force, you can use lethal force in their behalf. But there are some caveats. You must have seen the totality of the circumstance before you get involved. Uh, if you hear screaming and turn the corner and you've got two men holding a woman down and she's screaming for help and you come rolling in to save the day, only to discover that two undercover officers are arresting a murder suspect, well then you were not justified in that use of force. There's a lot of, a lot of layers to that onion. Uh, I would recommend highly my 45 minute video on this topic here on my, on my channel. Interaction with law enforcement after the incident. Think about this. First there's going to be the 911 call. 911, what is the nature of the emergency? State your name, where you are, what you, that you need uh, law enforcement and an ambulance, and that you've had to defend yourself. And then do not go down the road of answering too many other questions. Describe how you're dressed so the, the uh, dispatcher can, can make a more readily effective, uh, essentially, handover to the, to the responding officers. When they arrive, they're probably going to be in kind of an adrenalized state. You just don't know what kind of officer you're going to get. It could be the rookie with his first year in the car, or it could be the experienced guy with 22 years looking to retire, and he, he, this is in his first rodeo, and all points in between. When your officers, officers arrive, after the incident, you should move to a position of advantage or cover. When the officers arrive, establish eye contact, and then do exactly what they say. Do not be surprised if you are cuffed and put in the back of a car while they sort things out. Your first opportunity, you want to establish complainant status. Officer, that man tried to kill me. Point out his weapons. Point out any other witnesses. Make a basic statement. Express that you are willing to press charges. Express the orange, origins of your rational fear. 
It can't be, that guy didn't look right, so I shot him. That's not going to make it. It has to be a rational fear that he was advancing upon me with a weapon. He said he was going to rip my throat out. Words to that effect, actions to that effect. Point out any evidence and witnesses. And then, after you've given the basics, exercise your Fifth Amendment right by stating these words, these words. Officer, I wish to exercise my constitutional rights. Bam, end of sentence. And because I don't want just the Fifth Amendment, I want every amendment and penumbra that the framers ever thought of, and I want them all right there at that moment. Now then, subsequently to that, if you start talking about the incident, you will have just waived your Fifth Amendment right, and that information can be then admissible in the court, making your lawyer's life much harder. So, make the point, uh, make the statement, shut up, and wait for your lawyer to arrive.